girls look so pretty. Yeah, that's pretty. Very nice. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> they were waiting for me to say good morning. Welcome. <laughs> we have two very special guests and a few more guests throughout the morning to um, read some very special verses for us. So, welcome. went to look at the tomb, there was a powerful earthquake and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. The angel went to the tomb. He rolled back the stone and sat on it. His body shone like lightning. His clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, don't be afraid. I know that you are looking for Je Jesus who was crucified. Matthew, Matthew 28, verses 6 through 9. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said he would. Come and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly. Tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb. They were afraid, but they were filled with joy. They ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I, oh, I, oh, I see an empty grave. Come on. Ooh. Wipe away those tears, child, there's no need to cry. Stand up on your feet now, lift your head up high. Don't wait till tomorrow, lay down your sorrow, freedom is here today. Yeah. Wipe away those tears, child, put down your shame. Oh, I
tell the news. What started in the garden was finished in the tomb. It's all reversed, the apple, the curse, three days in the ground. Christ our Lord is risen, death couldn't hold him down. All right, so we got some good music today. <laughs> what do you think about having a choir every Sunday? Don't you love it? I do. I love these guys. Sing O. so loved the world that he gave his son, his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. 
For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. Understand more clearly. Then you will know the hope God has chosen you to receive. You will know that what God will give his holy people is rich and glorious. And you will know God's, God's great power. It can't be compared with anything else. His power works for us who believe. It is the same mighty strength God showed. He showed this when he raised Christ from the dead. God seated him at his right hand in his heavenly kingdom. There Christ sits far above all who rule and have authority. He sits. He also sits far above all powers and kings. He is above every name that is appealed to in this world and in the world to come. Now at his feet. 
Well, a very happy Resurrection Sunday to everybody here and online as well. Good morning. You, you know, if you, uh, as it, and the kids can come. Okay. Um, did, you, did you ever read the, the narratives of, of uh, first Resurrection Sunday morning and note who the calmest participant in that whole parade was? Jesus himself. He is so calm and so complete. And when you think about it, it's because his part was done. And it was done perfectly. And it was finished. And you guys and us like us are the result. So, uh, yeah. On Easter, take a hint from the boss. Take it calm and cool and enjoy what he did for you. So, uh, if you're a visitor with us this morning, welcome. Uh, We'd love to get to meet you and get a communication card from you, for we know who you are. And to that end, if you stop by the the booth in in the lobby and see Jan, she has a gift for any new visitors here this morning. We'd love to meet you. So why don't we take a moment in, in prayer and continue in our worship. Lord Jesus, Your church gathers across the globe this day to lift you up and return to you blessings and honor and praise for the completed work of the cross. We know, Lord, that the resurrection is a proof of what the cross did for all creation, and and we are included and blessed in that. So as our worship, as our study in the word, as our, as our teams behind us uh, bring you glory this day, join us through your spirit and uh, be exalted that we might exalt you and exalt your Father. Uh, we give you praise for all this in your name. Amen.
You would have thought by now. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so I was wondering. I was like, why? Is nobody hearing me? Everybody's like, no, we're not, we're not hearing you. You would have think by now uh, I would have figured it out, right? Uh, I want to read out of Luke's gospel. And if you were here with us on Good Friday, uh, you know, looking at just perspective. And in Luke's gospel, the 22nd chapter, starting in verse, verse 14, he says, When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And we think about that word suffer, the, the word passion actually has at its root this idea of suffering. So Jesus says when he, when he desired to eat this meal before he suffered, I believe he was also conveying just how passionate he was for what he was about to do. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some of the bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This is the cup which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. I think about the somberness of, of that night. I think about Jesus and his mood and his tone as he was preparing. And he took the bread and he knew what he was going to have to go through for each and every one of us. And yet it was his love that drove him to it. And I think about just the, the, the image of him being crushed. He was crushed, broken for us. So when we break the bread, we're, we're sharing in that crushing for us. Take. And then the wine. And I'm thinking about the wine and his blood. And we know that we get wine from grapes. But see, the wine is more powerful than the grape could ever be. The wine is more powerful and potent than the grape could ever be. But the only way you get wine is by crushing. And when Jesus was broken and his blood was poured out, the kingdom of darkness thought they had won. They said, we've crushed them. But he goes, no. I've actually become something more powerful in the breaking. So when we take this cup, we share in the power of God and what he accomplished that day on the cross. Drink. Those disciples that night, I wonder if they were like, what really lies before us? Have any of you ever thought about that? 
Jesus is saying all of this stuff to them? And are they going, what, what does this really mean? Here's, here's where we get to sit. We get to sit, as Pastor Mike Darby said, we get to sit as the result of that crushing and pouring out. And when we share in the Lord's table as we just have, we do it not knowing what, what we don't know what's ahead of us. We, we're not doing it going, I wonder what's to come. We do it in proclamation of something that we know is sure. The tomb is empty and he's returning. Amen? So when we share in that, we should rejoice every moment going, I know he's coming back. I know he's coming back. I know he's coming back. Amen? Amen. Father God, thank you for your love that was poured out in Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you for your love that led you to the cross. Thank you for your body and for your blood and that we get to be beneficiaries of that love. Father God, as we are gathered here today in celebration, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The little ones, are they being dismissed? Everybody, you know what? I love it. We're all together. Well, good morning. I love it. Are you guys excited? A little bit? Just a little. I came in this morning, and Brother Camden said, uh, uh, Cam Delashman said to me, uh, as I was walking around saying hello, he kind of smiled at me, and he goes, hey, it's a big day for you today, isn't it? And I kind of looked at him and said back, it's a big day for all of us. This is a big day for all of us. Can I share with you just a vision that I had in worship? Um, as the kids came up the first reading, uh, my mind goes sanctified imagination. I kind of go into my sanctified imagination. And I'm imagining Mary and them running to the tomb. And as the kids were reading, can you imagine this? Go in your sanctified imagination. Imagine this stone, right? And I forget, I read one time how big this stone was. But this stone is big, and a singular angel shows up and goes, boop, boop, and then hops on top of it. And he's like, hey, Jesus ain't here. Can you imagine that in your mind? what it would have been like. I think that is why whenever angels show up in the Bible, it's always followed by do not be afraid. <laughs> when they show up, it's amazing, right? So we are celebrating this morning. We are celebrating the fact that the tomb is empty. Amen? Amen? Man, I, man, we, we got to come to church. There's way too many of us in here to not have church this morning. So I'm going to help you out. We're going to do a little response, kind of like when I was in church. I'd say something, and you guys say it back. So we're going to do a little responsiveness in church today. I'm going to say, he is risen. Your response is, he is risen indeed. Can we try it? All right, here we go. He is risen. He is risen Almost. Okay, so from, from here over, we're going to try it. He is risen. He is risen you guys are okay. Pretty good. We're going to try from here to there. He is risen. He is risen I don't know, guys. We might have to come back. They did. All right, over here. He is risen. He is risen. All right, now everybody together. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. I love the fact that we get to celebrate our risen Savior. 
So this morning, we are going to celebrate our risen Savior. And, and today is not just Easter Sunday. As I was preparing, uh, you know, I think about kind of having gone to church a lot of my life. And a lot of times on days like today, it becomes just about the day. And we come to church and we celebrate and we're high on it. And then it's Easter Sunday. And then by 3 p.m., you're, we're all in food comas and, and, and it's over. So I thought, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do this a little different. We're going to say today marks the beginning. Instead of it being a, yay, we went to church on Easter Sunday and we celebrated a little bit, it's going to be a continuation. So we are going to, for this month, we're going to be looking at a series of messages called, This is Love. This is Love. At the cornerstone of that, I want us to remember this. Tuck it away. Put it in your heart. The resurrection changes everything. Let that sit. The resurrection changes everything. If the tomb is still got a body in it, then... It's kind of an interesting story. But the fact that the tomb is empty, everything is different. Clothing designers are known by their trademarks and brand logos. So a, a set of Nikes or a pair of Levi's or Gucci, we know and identify it immediately when we see the trademark. Is that true? We know it. You see the swoosh, everybody goes, Nike, right? Uh, they, they said that the little Air Jordan logo, can you, you ready for this? The little Air Jordan logo, even people that didn't play sports, they did such a great job of brand marketing that the Air Jordan going through the air, people who didn't play sports all over the world knew exactly who that was. So there are identifiers. There are professions in the world that you recognize immediately based on how they're attired. A police officer walks up in uniform and everybody goes, police. Or firemen. Or military. And if you're in one of those rooms and there's a guy sitting up there and he's got a black robe on, you go, judge. <laughs> right? So there are certain things that identify us. God gave an unmistakable and unquestionable identifier that we could use to gauge not only our life with him, but it would be a beacon to those who look, and that moniker or that, that brand mark was love. Jesus said it this way. He said love would be so identifiable that when people saw it, they would say, those are people who follow Christ. Now, I think in our culture a little bit, we use love so much that it kind of gets watered down. I love my car. I love my shoes. I love this TV show, right? I'm going to say love is the most powerful thing that we have on the planet. Love will cause you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. We will sacrifice in a way because of love that without it, we wouldn't do. So it's not only identifying, love is mobilizing. Before there was an Easter Sunday, there was a good Friday. I heard a song this morning and I wrote the words down because I think it brings it home. The cross 
is the proof that love moved first. The cross proves love moved first. So today's sermon title, within the This is Love theme, is a love that reigns. The theme today is a love that reigns. Now, within thinking about a love that reigns, I have a couple things that I would like for us to really be starting to ponder and think about. The first is that there can only be one king. There can only be one king. Jesus is, is on the earth. He's doing the most amazing things. He's proclaiming this new kingdom that is coming. He's saying God is in the process of restoring everything to its original intent. And then he goes on and he says, I am his son. And a lot of people looked at Jesus and said, he is the king of kings. Now, this creates a problem. Because Rome is the empire. And they got a guy that they've placed by the name of Herod. And Herod's job is basically to kind of oversee Israel. So now here we, we have a problem because we got this guy, Jesus, that's walking around and he's doing amazing things and people are going, this is the king. He's the Lord. But we got Herod here. And how many of you know uh, can't have two kings, right? So now what are we going to do about this two king problem. And it's unfortunate that it was the religious folk who Jesus was really interfering with, and they said, hey, we've got to come up with something to get rid of Jesus. So we're going to turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. And we're going to look at how they got rid of Jesus. And in verse 32 it says, As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, who they pressed into service to bear his cross. And when they had come to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. And after tasting it, he said he was unwilling to drink. I love it. Jesus said, no, I don't want my senses dulled. I'm going into this fully aware. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among them, casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you're going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, yet he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. The crucifixion of Christ is mocked with ridicule and doubt. These soldiers hang a sign above his head and they said, Jesus, the King of the Jews. And people walking by are mocking him, saying, If you're God's son, if you're the king, come down. And little did they know that in their mocking, they were actually declaring who he was. And what they missed 
was the power of God was not in whether or not he could save himself from crucifixion. The true power rested in his ability to overcome the death that the crucifixion would bring. They looked at him as weak. If you're God, come down. He said, because I am God, because I love you so much, I won't. I, I was talking to Nicole this week as I was preparing the message. My head runs like in film, in movie. I said, I wonder what the scene would have looked like if Jesus is hanging on the cross, beaten, broken, and they go, ha, 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 come down, and he would have went, okay. <laughs> Be afraid, right? But he didn't. He stayed there because love said, I have something more to do here. See, the difficulty a lot of times with experiencing the power of Jesus in our lives is that we look at Jesus and we expect Jesus to respond to us in ways that we think he should respond to us. We know people who have closed God out of their hearts because they're like, God's not doing anything for me. I'll follow Jesus if he heals. I'll follow Jesus if he saves my relative. I'll follow Jesus if he gives me a job. But until Jesus responds the way that I want, I want him to, I won't believe. Do any of us do that in our own lives? Can I borrow this chair? Oh, you don't have to get up. I'm just going to take this. There can only be one king in your life, too. It said that whoever sits on the throne of your heart reigns over your life. And the question is, is Jesus going to reign? Or am I going to reign? See, when I reign... When I sit on the throne of my life and I reign, then I make decisions that are selfish. I make decisions that don't consider the greater good. I make decisions that are solely about me. But when I clear the space and I let Jesus reign, then everything changes. I love different. I think different. I behave different. Now, if the tomb has got a body in it, None of this matters. But if he's risen, it changes everything because that makes him king. Amen? Amen? The next thing I would like you to consider this morning is Jesus going to the cross, being buried, and then resurrected he proves a love that reigns over death. Story I want to share with you. There's a renowned artist by the name of Paul Gustav Dorr. He lived between 1821 and 1883. He's traveling through Europe and he loses his passport. 
and he gets to one of the border crossings and there are guards there and he's talking to him and he's explaining his predicament and he says, hey, uh, this is who I am. I've, I've lost my passport. It, this is who I am, hoping that they would recognize him. Would you let me pass? And the guard said, you know, a lot of people do that. A lot of people claim to be someone different just to get through. And Dora's arguing with him. He goes, no, it's really, it's really me. And the guard finally says, okay, a test. And he hands Dora a piece of paper and a pencil. And he says, if you're the artist that you claim you are, I would like you to sketch some of the people who are standing around at the checkpoint. Dor takes the paper and the pencil, and he did it with such skill and speed and handed it back to him. The guy goes, you're the dude. And he lets him pass. We sang a song at the end. The tomb was borrowed for three days. Jesus goes in the tomb. They watched him die. They put him in the tomb, and three days later, he appears to his disciples and others, and he's eating and drinking and speaking with them. And they got to see the power of love on display. Jesus, in being resurrected, he served notice to death. He says, you no longer have the final word. God's love has the final word. And his resurrection proved his work. His word proved who he was. And then after he's resurrected, he's preparing to leave. And he says to his disciples, he gives them some marching orders. So we're going to look at that in Matthew's gospel, chapter 28. Verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Jesus, upon his resurrection, had been given power and authority in heaven and on earth. And then he gives his followers marching orders. And he says, I want you to take this love and put it on display in the earth. And then that leads us to the last thing to consider today on this celebration Sunday. Is letting love reign in you. I heard a quote that said, without God, man cannot. Without man, God will not. As followers of Christ, we have been invited to participate in a, an amazing story for all of history. The Greek word disciple actually means a learner or student. And when we follow after Christ, when we become a learner or a student, it's about a life changed. When we follow him, we become more like him. When I follow Jesus, it should make me more peaceful. It should make me more graceful. It should make me more loving. People 
people are crying out. I, I, you've heard me say it, you know, in church before, and it just, it just broke my heart. I was talking to a, a friend many years ago who was a Buddhist, and she had done some religious studies in college, and she studied the life of Christ. And here's what she said to me. It broke my heart. She said, I dig Christ. Don't care much for Christians. My heart is broken. It's like, where are, if, if I'm truly a disciple, if I'm truly, follow, I should be more like him. If people say, hey, I dig Christ, they should look at people who say we are Christ followers and go, yep, <laughs> we get it. Fourteen years old, I made the decision to follow the Lord. And now I sit here at age 50, and I've seen personally what can happen when Christ reigns and rules in a life. Without Christ, I would not be here. I would not be here. And my grandma Maxie, because that lady prayed herself right into heaven, I'm sure, for me. I believe that today I'm a better father, friend, pastor, coach, man, because I'm a disciple of Christ. So what does all this mean? I believe there are two people in the room today. Two people are here today. One, you're like, uh, I, I grew up and we went to church on Easter. And so it's, it's, it's what I do. But in many ways... I don't believe Christ has ever reigned in my life. And this morning, maybe, just maybe this morning, you're hearing for the first time the resurrection changes everything. And you're here this morning and you're saying for the first time, I want Jesus to reign and rule in my life. So I'm going to ask us to do this with every head bow and every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning, live or in person, in person or, or online, and this morning you're considering a love that reigns, and you're saying, I want that love to reign in my life. I've tried to do it by myself, on my own, for too long. And it's not working. And this morning, you're hearing maybe for the first time, maybe you've gone to church and you've heard it before, but for the first time, you're hearing, man, the resurrection changes everything. And I want that. If that is you this morning, here's what I'm going to ask. Humbly, if you go to the Lord and you say, Jesus, for the first time, I now trust and believe. You, you've proven everything by getting up out of the grave. And I want my life to mimic your life. And I surrender to you today. If that is you, if you've prayed that prayer and you believe it, with all of your heart, he says, welcome. I've been waiting for you. And I believe the second person in the room today, you have been a Christ follower, but you find yourself a lot of times, you're on the throne. And this morning, you're going, you know what? 
the resurrection did change everything. And the fact that he's no longer in the grave means I don't have the right to occupy the throne. And Lord, I'm surrendering anew to you my life. If that is you this morning, simply say, God, I surrender to you. The resurrection changes everything, and I want you to reign and rule in my life. Father God, we thank you for those that are here this morning and maybe for the first time have prayed to have you be the ruler of their life. And Father, we ask that people come beside them and strengthen them and encourage them as they walk this out new with you. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that will be their forever companion. And Father God, for those of us this morning who say, you know, I've tried to do it on my own way too long and I no longer can. And I'm turning it all back over to you. We ask them for the strength and the courage to keep going, knowing that you have everything covered. Lord, we thank you this morning for the empty tomb. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Worship team, come on up. Amen. All these people coming up. I love it. I love it. And we join uh, you in celebration for those of you that might have given your life to Christ this morning. Praise the Lord. And why don't you join us? Stand up if you'd like. We're going to sing this awesome old gospel song. It's been around for a long time. <laughs> Because we know that he rose and he's coming back again. And I look so forward to that day, don't you?
this morning, I want you to take this with you. This is love. And the resurrection changes everything. Amen? Amen. Go celebrate. Thank you.